Good evening, Olga. Good evening, students. But Olga, for you, what's the time? Uh, nine o'clock in the morning. Good morning, US, and good evening, Europe. Uh, the other way around in the morning, we have been to Japan, so it was the other way. <laughs> and now we go uh, to the US. Let me shortly introduce Olga Banova. Olga Banova is a um, research professor at the University of Houston's College of Engineering and director of the Master of Science in Space Architecture program uh, at SIGSA. It's if you ever want to study space architecture and earn a degree in space architecture, you should go to Houston and see Olga Banova. She conducts research and design studies of orbital, of orbital and surface habitats and silt mines. Um, she is, I'm also very proud that she is co-author of the book Space Architecture Education for Engineers and Architects. Did this project together, and I think we worked on the book three years, and then we finished it in 2016. Uh, besides that, Olga Banovo has a lot of publications, technical publications related to space architecture. Her students are also uh, very well known, becoming very well known in the field of space architecture. Uh, she is the chair of the AIA Space Architecture Technical Committee and also a member of the Technical Committee on Space Engineering and Construction. Uh, overall, she has been teaching students for the last 14 years and she has worked on all sorts of extraterrestrial architectures ranging from lunar base to airlock studies to space hub system and even launch facilities. And I am happy to give the word to Olga. And today she will talk about greenhouse technologies and design, which uh, is probably also new to all of you. So please feel free to ask questions. And thank you very much, Olga, for coming. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, for the introduction. Good to see you all. Uh, and I can start sharing my screen now. Oh, you, okay. You need to let me share. No, no. <laughs> can you do? Okay. Oh, hold on just one second again. And okay. So everyone uh, can see the screen, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, good again. Good to see you all. And uh, this is uh, a presentation which is uh, of course will be uh, a lot of technical um, specifics uh, probably will be left aside because it's a big issue and it's a big uh, design issue uh, greenhouse design and uh, especially all this uh, new and emerging technologies that can be used uh, for successful greenhouses uh, and uh, in space and uh, on other planetary bodies and celestial bodies, including Moon and Mars. Uh, so I decided to build this presentation as the first looking at as a space uh, architecture and, and elements uh, in general. So and uh, what is this? Uh, what the space? What the goal of space architecture is? because uh, the whole idea of having greenhouses uh, in space or on Mars or Moon is for a reason that to serve that major space architecture goal that is we are serving humans and those are need uh, to sustain human lives of Earth uh, to make it sustainable. 
uh, for long uh, period of times. Uh, the scene is again the space architecture with looking at, uh, at, the, at humans, we're looking at crew or space tourists or whoever will go uh, there uh, beyond Earth, uh, how we can provide maximum comfort for them, uh, how we can uh, still meet all these uh, string, uh, strict requirements and um, restrictions that uh, associated with the space flight and uh, space conditions. Uh, so how uh, we can uh, support uh, the mission, all the goals, scientific goals, exploration goals, or tourism goals, or commercial goals. Uh, and uh, also how we can uh, make it all safe uh, for uh, humans, uh, for systems, for everything that is uh, going beyond it, beyond uh, the Earth's boundaries. Uh, again, looking at different types of space missions, it also defines uh, what are the elements of space architecture will be needed for a certain mission and uh, what kind of operations and concept of operations will be needed for certain missions. Again, if we're talking about uh, servicing and uh, missions and maintaining station or spacecraft, so maybe it's just uh, uh, one type of uh, activities that need to be supported. But if you're going farther and talking about tourism and entertainment and uh, uh, commercial activities and expanding the human presence uh, in orbit or moon or Mars, then uh, it will require many more systems. It will require many more different types of supporting systems. And again, uh, growing plants, uh, uh, greenhouses, and other associated uh, systems and activities are uh, will be required and are essential for success of those missions. So um, again, the thing is uh, when if uh, we're talking about going to space and we're talking about those big and long-term missions. Uh, so we need to work within the certain uh, restrictions. You probably have already heard about them uh, through this uh, series of lectures and uh, from Sandra. Uh, the, first of all, we need to all bring it up. Uh, and uh, so we need to work with great mass and volume launch constraints. Uh, also protect the systems from all the hazards that we see in space and uh, deep space and on planetary bodies. Uh, all the difficulties uh, that uh, we will uh, see in uh, different uh, planetary bo bodies on Moon or Mars, it's talking about dust again, uh, very difficult, unpredictable terrain, different geological features and all of that. <coughs> So uh, going from uh, early missions uh, farther uh, to, to Mars, that uh, will require more systems, more elements, but since the very early missions, uh, people started looking at uh, what needs to be done if we want to sustain life for a long period of times. Uh, and that uh, included, of course, uh, growing things, uh, supporting, making is uh, the environment uh, uh, tolerable, not only for humans, but also for all these other systems. And if we bring plants, it will be plants. So how much power, how much uh, uh, issues, how much systems, what we need to bring there. And of course, again, this, uh, the real, uh, issue is how much power we will need. So that also determines a lot of activities, what we can do and what we cannot do, depending on what kind of power uh, sources we have and how much power we can generate uh, either in flight, uh, in space, on orbit, or uh, on the surface of a planet. Uh, so how, those, uh, how the power will be brought to those elements uh, how this power will be distributed, uh, how those the power systems will be uh, maintained and what that will require. 
uh, to maintain them properly, uh, how safe they are and where they should be located to, in, in case, for example, the nuclear type of uh, uh, power sources like uh, kilopower that is uh, support, uh, proposed by NASA for Mars exploration. And now it's not only kilopower, it's also megapower because for activities and for systems like uh, uh, greenhouse uh, systems, it will uh, require a lot of uh, power and uninterrupted power. And talking about uh, maintenance uh, and uh, technical support and upgrading uh, technologies and systems, then it all goes back to uh, how we bring things uh, there from Earth initially at least. Uh, so how uh, often uh, we can have resupply missions, uh, how those resupply missions will be delivered, who will be delivering, who will be uh, taking care of uh, those uh, elements and uh, those activities, how it will be offloaded, how it will uh, from the lander, uh, let's say, uh, is it will be fully robotic or it will require EVA systems, uh, or uh, a lot of EVA activities. So uh, the crew will have to assist uh, robotic missions. So all of that uh, affects the whole architecture uh, of the mission. And also it all affects what we can have and what we cannot have and how long we can have it. And uh, so what we can do with it when it actually becomes obsolete, what kind of uh, emergency procedures we need to plan ahead and how we can design for those emergency situations. Uh, so we won't lose everything. And again, uh, uh, talking about our clients as architects are talking about clients, uh, talking about the crew or tourists, uh, researchers, scientists who will be on those missions, uh, how we will take care of them. And uh, it's, uh, we have uh, the of the crew and we are as humans, we have many uh, needs, uh, psychological and physiological needs to take care of, uh, but also space uh, creates issues uh, and creates uh, physiological and psychological deconditioning related to the long space flight, uh, confined environment, uh, microgravity conditions, uh, radiation um, and um, uh, all of that uh, all together uh, affects us uh, not only physically, but mentally. And uh, detachment from Earth, detachment for, from our uh, loved ones, it also affects our psychological condition during the long-term flight. So how we can uh, help is a very important question. And how we are as designers can help is a very important question. And that's again, uh, very much related to the aspect of having natural environment or some, some at least presence of natural environment during these uh, long space flights or on the surface of moon or Mars. Uh, so um, yeah, so this is just uh, the examples of uh, interior arrangements, which are, of course we can make it adaptable as much uh, as possible to different stages of the mission, but yet it's still a uh, very confined environment and there is still uh, isolation. There is still uh, all artificial environment around us. So uh, as I said, since the very early uh, experiments um, in space flight and first space stations, uh, first, it was uh, with the Salyut space stations and with Soviet uh, space program. When uh, uh, biomedical experiments uh, became a very important uh, part of every uh, Salyut mission, starting with small chambers and they, they uh, grew and experimented with different types of uh, uh, plants. What is interesting that it wasn't only uh, plants uh, for eating. They also experimented with plants uh, uh, for um, aesthetic purposes, such as orchids. You will see this um, uh, on the right, low right. 
uh, image is uh, orchids that were grown on um, a salute station. And there is a picture on the left from them. It's uh, Jean-Luc Chrétien uh, who visited salute station. Uh, and uh, uh, so those experiments uh, brought the first results uh, and uh, how plants can adapt to microgravity conditions mostly. And uh, the goal was to uh, go and create the whole loop. So when the plants will grow from a seed and then produce seeds in space. So it wasn't an easy uh, to achieve that and not all the plants uh, responded to that. Uh, so different experimentations uh, continued uh, later on uh, Mir stations. And uh, Mir station, of course, had much better conditions. Actually, it's important to say that on salute stations, probably plants had better conditions than humans. Uh, because uh, the stations, all uh, salute stations, didn't have uh, enough uh, uh, power to uh, sustain uh, good I mean, uh, warm temperature inside the habitat. Uh, they did install additional solar panels later on, but still it was always about uh, 16 degrees Celsius inside. And uh, so it was uh, relatively dark, no more. Uh, private quarters um, and but plants had their own chambers so plants were taken care of very nicely so on Mir station it was already better so first experiments uh, with wheat were done there and uh, that wheat was brought back uh, to earth and uh, bread was baked so they did discover that uh, plants changed uh, their composition and uh, uh, so some means uh, to uh, help plants to deal with microgravity is also important. So uh, I will talk uh, a little bit uh, later about artificial uh, gravity environment. So uh, that's probably maybe a good idea to introduce it for plant growth in uh, microgravity conditions, some rotating environment. It's also interesting to note that uh, experiments in rotate, growing plants in rotating environment on Earth showed some good results. So not changes in their um, qualities, but uh, the, the yield was uh, larger from uh, plants uh, introduced to rotating environment rather than those that uh, grew in normal conditions. Um, so uh, those experiments, early experiments, and this, those experiments that are conducted right now on the International Space Station, uh, they are still in small scale. Yes, uh, astronauts and cosmonauts did eat some lettuce, and they uh, right now they got uh, radishes um, harvested, but not for eating all of them. All the radishes were sent back to Earth actually for uh, testing. Uh, but uh, something was uh, added and it was nice addition to their otherwise uh, relatively mundane um, menu. But uh, uh, going from the small scale to large scale is not an uh, easy task. Because uh, to have better yield to support and uh, the uh, crew uh, is uh, uh, these freshly grown vegetables on a regular basis, it will require much more um, volume. It will require more, uh, uh, more spaces, more power. And it, uh, on top of those re requirements, uh, this uh, will be uh, important to uh, maintain that uh, the quality of plants that growing again from the seed to seed without compromising their um, nutrition qualities. Uh, also those uh, areas or those volumes, those sections of the habitat will have to provide special conditions that uh, will help the plants to grow better 
uh, pollinization is an issue uh, in the uh, coolest environment as well. Uh, they uh, do grow better uh, with uh, natural light. And uh, by the way, Kasmanat Lebedev, uh, who participated in the experiments on uh, Salut, he did, um, and Mu stations, he did uh, suggest that some uh, or bigger windows or bigger portholes, so providing uh, natural light uh, to the plants will be a good idea in the spacecraft. Either or he even suggested using a solar concentrate a concentrator, and that will be the light will be brought inside to a plant growth area with uh, either fiber optics or some other means. Uh, so uh, another issue that uh, shouldn't be forgotten that how you deal with all the not eatable part of the plants, so biomass, how that can be utilized, how uh, you will deal with it, what it, can it be used for something actually useful? Or uh, if not, so what can you get out of it and what you will be doing with the rest, what will be rest out of it? Uh, so um, all of these uh, uh, challenges, will have to be solved uh, within this confined environment of a space habitat or greenhouse, if it's a separate structure. And we have only few options for those structures. Uh, So-called, you know, type one, it can be just hard shell structures or type two, it's expandable. Is there also hard shell telescopic modules? or soft shell like inflatable structures. And of course, uh, another uh, option uh, when it will be, technology will be there and you, we will be able to use local resources uh, for building structures on moon or Mars, so-called ISRU based. Uh, so uh, the conditions uh, in space, again, if we're talking about different gravity conditions, uh, there are microgravity or zero gravity if you go farther deeper in space, then partial gravity conditions and artificial gravity. Uh, each of these conditions presents certain issues uh, that have to be solved uh, by yeah, architects and engineers when designing space habitats, especially uh, pressurized structures. Uh, that is important to consider uh, that each uh, condition has its own uh, complications. Although some of them can be probably addressed in a similar way, but some actually quite different. Uh, for example, uh, human mobility and operations. Uh, so in microgravity, on one hand, yes, uh, can float easily through you, the habitat. On the other hand, you don't want uh, to uh, be stranded in the middle of a large space where you cannot reach anywhere and to push yourself from or pull towards. So, uh, you need um, also, rest so it, you need restraint systems. Uh, in partial gravity, it may be easier, but then uh, traction may be uh, a problem because of uh, reduced gravity conditions. Traction is lower, so it will be uh, harder to move things around. Uh, and artificial gravity is very different because you need to be aware of the direction of the spin and direction of the spacecraft. Uh, and so uh, you're constantly aware uh, where you will be lighter or heavier. If you, you will be lighter towards the center of the spin and it heavier uh, farther from the center of the spin. Uh, so uh, cues where the direction of the um, rotation is important to know. Uh, housekeeping and maintenance is also complicated uh, in all of these environments. Maybe partial gravity, it's a little bit more like Earth, but we still don't know. By the way, we still don't know in artificial gravity how human will be uh, reacting to switching directions. Either you go uh, one way and then you turn 90 degrees 
so your inner ear is confused every time you maybe we can adapt very fast to these conditions so we will be switching without problems or maybe not so that's um, important to consider uh, to, when designing anything uh, where people or other things will be present because even uh, for let's say greenhouses where people may not be present all the time but when they are there they should be able to serve uh, the systems they serve uh, the plants and uh, so from, from operational perspective it's always important to um, remember uh, all, all these complications associated with uh, uh, different gravity conditions and of course as i mentioned before psychological and physical adaptation is uh, important uh, to consider when designing all uh, elements, all um, habitats, all systems where people will be present, will be present. How to help uh, people to uh, adjust, uh, how do people uh, help them to work and being uh, effective, how the design should be different to help them to adjust and be effective. Uh, whatever they are doing, either they servicing systems or they relaxing, or they just enjoying uh, team building and uh, having some team activities. So all of that needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, so along nature light uh, through uh, enlargement of portholes or use of solar concentrators will be important. And here is an example how a rotating uh, greenhouse uh, elements can be incorporated into a toroidal structure around, um, around the central core where all the systems will be located. So perhaps an, one option would be to have all the uh, pallets with um, plants uh, rotating uh, around um, their local center of rotation and be placed uh, around the core where the systems are. Uh, it will create some issues uh, because um, uh, the connecting uh, those um, plants beds with uh, uh, systems that will distribute water and nutrition will be a difficult engineering issue. But uh, uh, perhaps uh, it can be uh, distributed in, uh, when they are stop when they stop rotating, and then they will have this uh, uh, separate internal systems uh, where uh, storage that will provide the nutrition and water distribution when they are rotating when they start their rotating rot rotations. Um, uh, so again, uh, a little bit about all these uh, pressurized structures and different types of uh, uh, modules that uh, I mentioned before. So of course, uh, all of you know now by now that it has to be a pressurized uh, structure. Uh, we have to contain a lot of uh, pressure inside. Uh, to distribute uh, it evenly, uh, those structures usually are either spherical or uh, cylindrical or toroidal structures that just uh, to make the pressure distribution even and uh, minimize the structural um, uh, difficulties. So because to maintain structural integrity is uh, better to have the pressure distributed evenly around the space uh, habitat or any uh, pressurized space module. So uh, that uh, brings us to the next, so what are these types and how they would look? And again, you probably know about this. So those uh, first type structures, hard shell structures are the ones that are most commonly used and known. And they have been used since uh, earlier missions uh, and since earlier stations were built, assembled. 
uh, built and assembled uh, in low Earth orbit. So starting with Salut, uh, Skylab, Mir, and now in the International Space Station. Uh, most likely the first uh, structures on the Moon or Mars uh, will be these type of structures. Uh, they are very volume restricted uh, because they have to comply and fit in a payload shroud. Uh, but uh, they offer that uh, very important advantage of uh, having all these systems reintegrated before the launch. So everything can be tested uh, on Earth first. So we know that uh, and uh, that they will be working, those systems uh, will be working before we launch them. And that is a big advantage. Uh, they um, cannot expand, so the volume is uh, still small. And especially again, uh, if we're going farther from Earth, when we don't have uh, uh, lo regular logistical support, so we need to bring a lot of things with us, uh, then um, uh, it's important to have expandable structures. It's also ex important to have them once we are on Moon or Mars, so we can uh, have more things uh, we can uh, can stay longer uh, in those environments, in those habitats. So we have more uh, comfort for the crew and for uh, more ways to distribute and deal with different systems that we need to have with us. Uh, so one way of explaining it would be uh, the telescopic types of structures uh, where this uh, smaller portion will be fitting in the larger portion during the launch, and then it will deploy uh, once it's at the destination. Uh, there are many issues with that as well. Uh, yes, it offers more volume at the end, but uh, all the uh, structures, uh, pre-integrated structures can be only located in the inner portion of the telescopic structure. Uh, they tend to become uh, quite heavy and uh, there is potential of leakage, uh, atmospheric leakage, uh, where these uh, two uh, parts of the uh, module are connected. But it's uh, uh, still give you almost double more uh, volume that you have uh, during the launch. Uh, here is an example uh, from, from NASA and uh, this uh, proposal for uh, uh, lunar gateway um, module and uh, utilizing a green wall. Again, so that wouldn't provide substantial or major uh, support for the uh, food uh, for the crew, uh, but it will be additional uh, important um, nutrition factor. Uh, so uh, the next deployable structures would be inflatable, so it definitely provide way more volume uh, if uh, you have large radius uh, of this uh, inflatable structure. Uh, they are packable, the steel walls are pretty thick, so you cannot really pack it as a you know, piece of fabric, obviously. Uh, it's multi-layered structures. Uh, they um, also have uh, some disadvantages. Of course, uh, they uh, cannot have uh, many pre-integrated systems inside. So the crew will have to outfit those um, modules after they are deployed. So all those um, uh, systems have to be brought in some other uh, type of module. And then once uh, this inflatable is deployed, uh, then the crew will uh, bring and install, or crew robotic assistant will uh, uh, install all those elements inside the inflatable part of it. Uh, those, uh, those structures definitely give you a lot of potential, uh, gives uh, more room for the crew, gives more room for uh, systems. Uh, and uh, they are good um, options for uh, future um, greenhouses, either on orbit or uh, 
on planetary bodies. Uh, so, um, talking about, uh, about microgravity uh, design considerations for biotechnical life support systems. So, what would be, uh, what, is, what is there? So, there is, and what uh, we don't know, or what we do know. So, luckily, uh, we learned quite a lot about microgravity environment. Uh, how uh, fluid dynamics uh, will work and uh, everything should be, uh, of course, pumped, including air. So all water or nutrition, if it's for the plants, everything has to be pumped. Uh, the issue with pumps uh, is uh, they have filters and the stuff grows on those filters. So that systems have to be replaced regularly. So it's a lot of logistical support will be required and a lot of maintenance operations. Uh, so for the plants, especially uh, in micro G, there are changes in meta metabolic uh, pattern. And uh, so uh, they do change uh, uh, their uh, physiological reactions. And then uh, at the end, uh, they may become less nutritious, nutritious for the crew than they are on Earth. Uh, also, what was noted from the early experiments on Salut and Mir, even since then, uh, that uh, they uh, age faster. It's actually kind of similar uh, between humans and plants. So humans also age uh, faster uh, in, uh, in space, uh, or at least some, um, some parts of our body age faster. Uh, and again, uh, the in, in, in closed environment, uh, in a confined environment, uh, then uh, human presence uh, contributes to higher bacterial and fungal pre uh, presence in, in the habitat. So which means, so fungus and uh, all sorts of different fungus and uh, bacteria and diseases uh, can uh, jeopardize uh, plants in, uh, in this environment if uh, humans and plants uh, share the same space. And again, as I uh, mentioned, the maintenance and housekeeping is uh, difficult or uh, let's say challenged. So, but possible to do. So what that means uh, from architectural perspective. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, we need to think about uh, spaces for, and, uh, for supporting systems and all the utility runs that will be needed to support uh, greenhouses or plant growth uh, chambers. Uh, so how, again, water will be distributed, how air will be distributed there, how uh, nutrition will be distributed there. Uh, again, back to this uh, maintenance and housekeeping, uh, a lot of pumps and a lot of filters and all of that will be uh, uh, needing uh, regular cleaning. Uh, again, uh, with uh, perhaps 3D printing, some of it can be easier. Uh, filters uh, on the ISS, for example, those filters, uh, they're constantly replaced. You cannot clean them. That film that is growing in microgravity environment uh, doesn't go anywhere. Grows uh, gets there pretty fast. Uh, and uh, all you can do is just replace it. Um, so uh, arranging uh, for contingency plans, uh, let's say if uh, some of the plant gets compromised, got uh, some disease, so you want to uh, remove it as fast as possible so it won't contaminate the rest of it. Uh, so uh, also all those um, uh, elements or chambers, growing cha uh, growth chambers, they have to be uh, designed in such a way that it will be easy to reach out, to fix it, to check, to replace, rotate, or to deal 
of course, harvest uh, and uh, clean as all of it uh, has to be uh, very easily um, doable. Uh, and uh, it will be uh, important to uh, have uh, and replicate at least natural light uh, for the plants. It's very important for plants to, to grow and to get a good yield out of it. Uh, again, back to zoning and uh, efficient volume, mass and area ratio, everything has to be designed just right. <laughs> so you, 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 on one hand, you have to provide enough uh, room to maintain and operate with these uh, systems and uh, plant beds and everything. On the other hand, you can't afford having it uh, open and having these extra spaces. So it's always a good balance between what we can and what we cannot, what is feasible to do. And uh, uh, air circulation is also very critical. It's very critical for humans. It's very critical for plants. Anything that is uh, alive uh, has to have this airflow. You don't want to uh, bubble of uh, CO2 or oxygen having hanging somewhere in one place. So again, this uh, uh, just uh, examples uh, of uh, how it may look. Same thing, this rotating environment inside of inflatable structure with all the utility runs in the middle uh, with water and uh, air being pumped. Uh, and uh, uh, so these uh, um, small, well, relatively small chambers, rotating chambers are located around the uh, major core where all, all the nutrition and water and air is brought to them. And periodically it's distributed to those rotating chambers and then they continue their rotation. Another option is where this habitat uh, with uh, 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 equipment uh, rain access uh, will be uh, in the middle Again, all the utilities are run in the middle and uh, all the uh, plant growth chambers are located in toroidal structures around it. And uh, this is just a, one example of how uh, space uh, craft for long-term uh, flight uh, may look like, where it's a very, again, artificial environment and would, would really benefit from uh, uh, combining it with something like uh, like that with uh, an inflatable part, uh, structure where a greenhouse can be installed even if you just go there to harvest and service it it's still a good uh, switch activities it's still a very important uh, different type of activities for the crew uh, in artificial gravity um, there are other issues uh, and similar issues that uh, uh, we have to deal with in microgravity environment, uh, but there are many, many things that we don't know. Uh, we don't know exactly how fluid dynamics will be uh, working in a rotating environment. We can do simulations, but again, uh, rotating environment on Earth where 1G is still present in rotating environment in micro G, will be different. So that needs to be tested. Uh, and um, again, uh, this uh, uh, plant growth in rotating environment off Earth hasn't been tested before. Uh, same thing with uh, introducing uh, humans or human environment to plant environment or vice versa also gives potential for growing more uh, uh, microbio, uh, micro, microflora that is not very healthy for the crew or not very healthy for the plants. Uh, again, same thing related to the pollination and maintenance uh, difficulties. Uh, it's also uh, present there. Okay, how it's different for from architectural perspective. So uh, several uh, issues are very similar to microgravity conditions, but some are different. 
again, um, distribution of the nutrients, water and air will be different in uh, artificial gravity environment. Uh, do need to uh, consider the direction of the spin uh, and uh, what will be happening between the, uh, when the aircraft will be switching uh, from uh, microgravity to artificial gravity environment. Because again, spinning doesn't happen at once. So uh, it still will be microgravity environment at some point. And then it's when the spin starts, then it's only when artificial gravity conditions will kick off. So what will be happening in the transitional parts, we don't know and how to deal with it. It's a big and very interesting engineering uh, issue. Uh, so perhaps we can test it before uh, really committing to building something large like artificial gravity environment with the large rotating structures. And one of the proposal was uh, it's, uh, one of our students proposed uh, testing it in low earth orbit and testing systems and uh, humans uh, just having two dragon modules uh, connected to Pierce module, Russian module, and with progress uh, using it as a tag and uh, first charging at, off the International Space Station and then taking off and starting rotating and testing the systems, how this, all these issues uh, will be happening or not happening and what will be happening with all those uh, distributing systems. Uh, and then potentially how will people will uh, react uh, to spin and, and uh, different uh, direction of the spin. Uh, then maybe later on something large can be built where uh, in the middle we can test everything that's related to microgravity conditions. And then here, uh, uh, here it will be uh, something that is related to uh, lunar conditions, uh, so it's one sixth of gravity. And at the end of the uh, truss, it will be a module where uh, systems can be tested for one third of gravity that's similar to Mars. But uh, that will be cool to have it before actually committing and going to uh, those environments or committing to build something large. So we know uh, more about our systems and, and about our behavior. Uh, so partial gravity conditions also uh, have some uh, obviously issues. Um, again, uh, on one hand, we can think that, well, it's at least some gravity. So it's similar to uh, Earth. On the other hand, uh, well, we don't know because it's only partial gravity. So uh, maybe uh, fluids will be working different. So some conditions has to be changed. Some systems have to be redesigned. Uh, again, we don't know how plants will respond and what will be happening uh, with uh, plants uh, when they will be growing in partial gravity conditions. Uh, same issue with human presence. Uh, and um, uh, jeopardizing uh, plants uh, with uh, our bacteria and uh, potential for mold growth and all of that, that is still an issue because even partial gravity, but still it will be pressurized structure, isolated structure uh, and um, confined structure on the moon or Mars. Uh, again, uh, we don't know how pollination will be happening. Perhaps gravity will help it, but uh, still needs to be tested before we need to learn about it first. Uh, so uh, what is uh, for us uh, as architects, what is uh, there? So how uh, we can design the most efficient way uh, for greenhouses on uh, moon or Mars. Same thing, uh, dedicated probably and in independent structures, uh, for, especially for large scale uh, greenhouses will be needed. We don't want to mix it with uh, permanent human presence. Uh, we um, 
need to design for contingency plans, the same uh, without uh, the potential for losing the whole structure if something goes wrong. Not only from the perspective of a plant uh, goes bad and uh, contaminates the rest of the plants, but also potential for uh, structure, losing structural integrity, let's say, if uh, pressurization issues happens or leakage starts happening. So how to design in such a way that uh, we don't lose the whole structure. We can isolate that uh, damaged uh, part of it or segment of it. Uh, also similar, of course, uh, the light, uh, we can need to bring the natural light if possible. And uh, hopefully on uh, moon or Mars, it will be the way to bring natural light into the greenhouses. That would be nice. Uh, in all locations, we still need to design to protect uh, uh, plants uh, from radiation and micrometeoroids. So the structure still will be uh, pretty um, uh, strong and thick. And uh, we still have to have multi-layer systems. But uh, uh, considering uh, natural light uh, options and bringing it inside the greenhouse, it's still important. Uh, and uh, again, uh, related to fluids, because air is fluids, uh, so how this, uh, the air will be distributed uh, in partial gravity conditions, we don't know, but uh, need to provide uh, at least means to deal with it. Uh, so it's, we don't have natural ventilation there, obviously, but uh, so how the to deal with the larger volume where the air will be uh, brought and returned in the most efficient way is important uh, design consideration. Uh, so again, this uh, some uh, examples and again, combination of inflatable and uh, hard shell module where all the systems are located uh, in the bottom part and then in the inflatable, the greenhouse is located. Uh, remember the same issue. So uh, it will require quite a lot of outfitting. It also requires quite a lot of effort to go up and down and uh, also to harvest and uh, to service the plants, some special means will be needed. So there is a lot of potential for different types of designs. And uh, that's just one option, uh, doesn't necessarily is uh, the best. So it's always uh, good to see how uh, else uh, this can be arranged. Uh, another uh, example is uh, this bringing it if you want to bring uh, anything inside the habitat. So those chambers have to be separated and consider how they will be separated from living environment. But of course, uh, having it uh, inside um, or being able to see uh, plants growing inside the habitat adds uh, quality of life uh, for the crew. And um, maybe not as a major um, nutrition provider, but major psychological uh, uh, measure or to maintain psychological health measure that can be considered. Um, uh, again, as uh, I said, uh, on the uh, planetary exploration missions need to deal with radiation, steel, micrometeoroids, extreme temperatures, uh, the spaces are still confined, uh, there is no infrastructure uh, and there are no resources or very limited resources before we figure out how we deal with it, how we can extract and uh, manipulate with them. So before uh, in-situ resource utilization infrastructure is there. <clears throat> there is no <clears throat> transportation and there are many, many unknown conditions. So that we don't know <clears throat> how systems will grow, uh, will work, how plants will grow, all of that and uh, allowing uh, some flexibility, how the systems can be rearranged, how we can rearrange with the plants or for the plants. That's important aspect of design. Uh, 
the thing is that uh, uh, we don't have to bring everything with us, at least at the initial stages of development and for uh, first uh, greenhouses. That is a very crucial aspect. Uh, so what do you bring and what you don't bring, what you uh, can replace and what you can not, uh, and how you can uh, reuse systems. Uh, that's a very important consideration. Uh, another thing I mentioned earlier is uh, how to deal with biomass. Uh, that is very much related to plant selection, uh, what you eat, what you don't eat, and uh, how much uh, a certain plant produ produce biomass. Uh, of course, we're talking about uh, closed loop uh, life support systems or close to closed loop. Uh, of course, uh, from biomass, all the uh, moisture will be taken out, but still, uh, whatever what can be done with what, what was, will be left out of it uh, is a very uh, important question because obviously we cannot burn it there. Well, we don't, we can maybe inside the habitat, but we don't want to, right? Uh, so we cannot bring it outside and just dig a hole uh, and put it there. Uh, so what can be done? Using it for different purposes, using it for um, as a binder uh, for 3D printing, uh, using it uh, for um, radiation protection uh, or some any, any type of uh, processing uh, will require extra um, power and extra volume and extra spaces. Uh, so uh, lo looking at this uh, greenhouse or habitat or anything as a part of the big uh, picture of the big architecture is always uh, important, not only for um, uh, better design, but for better future design, let's say, uh, because how these systems uh, will be repurposed or those uh, uh, modules will be repurposed if they can be repurposed for something else when they, uh, in the end of their life cycle. Uh, if it will be a storage or not, if these, um, uh, those elements become part of something else or will be reused for something else is uh, important to consider. And uh, uh, the same thing. So if uh, you bring some idea as a part of some technology as part of a greenhouse or habitat or anything, so it's important to see how it will affect all these other solutions uh, or all the other architectures that you have uh, on the surface or as a part of your spacecraft. Um, yeah, so that's uh, another uh, potential, of course, uh, using this local topographies uh, for our um, habitation on Moon or Mars. Again, if uh, you consider bringing elements, uh, habitats, or it will be, again, greenhouses or any systems under the surface, how you will bring this uh, nature light there, how you bring the power, how you bring all the other systems to it, uh, how you connect them with, with each other, uh, or uh, maintain them and uh, remove them if needed. That's important to consider. Uh, again, uh, if you put something in lava tubes, it's pretty much the same thing. So if you put under, uh, under a lot of regoliths, so uh, the issues of connecting elements, uh, bringing uh, natural light, bringing uh, resources to it, maintaining is a critical consideration for any architectures in these uh, uh, conditions. Uh, well, uh, uh, I think it's a good uh, quote from Tsiolkovsky's uh, 14 goals to conquer the outer space. He was uh, talking about uh, the sun and using these uh, uh, power resources that are available in space for our benefits. 
uh, and uh, not only respiration, but nutrition and other living purposes, which is considered by space biologists as a direct indication that uh, Tsiolkovsky was also thinking about growing plants and the importance of growing plants of Earth for sustaining life. So, um, and on that, uh, I am ready for questions. Thank you, Olga. Mm -hmm. So, um, let's see. Are there any questions? I can stop sharing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, yes. yes, I would have one question, actually. Please, Linda. Yeah, sorry, I just need to get ready. Wait, I need to open the... Uh, just one second. Pardon me. <laughs> so, can you guys see me? Yes. yes you. Perfect. Hi, Ms. Benova. I want to thank you so much about your... Um, a wonderful uh, presentation at first. And um, since you were talking about the uh, future building architecture on in space, I was actually wondering uh, rather if because we talked about, I mean, you talked about um, uh, the simulation of gravity that would be uh, rotating on the planet and uh, how would that would take place on, uh, on space. And I was wondering when we start building in space, would we actually, how would that take place? Like the whole building process, would we need to, to build there or would we build them on earth and then transport the structures as the ready ones into space? Or would we need to do a simulation of the whole uh, building process? I mean, like it just popped up as a question and you seem, uh, I mean, like uh, from the whole information that you delivered us that you can give me maybe a staple and like a good input answer. And I would really be interested to know your point of view. It, it depends if uh, there is something very large and uh, consists of several elements, uh, you will have to assemble it somewhere. Uh, <laughs> it's really related to where you will be assembling these elements depends on many factors. Uh, a lot depends on yeah, partially it's uh, orbital mechanics and uh, where you go. Uh, there are always trade-offs. Uh, the thing is, the reason why uh, we cannot launch big thing, assemblers you know, on Earth and there, because we cannot launch it. So we launch everything. You saw those rockets. So yeah. at the very, very top, that's uh, it's called so. payload, yeah. So that's what uh, <laughs> uh, that's the confined space where uh, the payload shroud, uh, where any, all these elements should fit. With heavy lift vehicles, we can uh, bring quite large structures. Uh, wow. With SLS, it's up to ten meters in diameter, which is very large, um, and. Um, in fact, as I said, in microgravity environment, if it's, uh, you will have 10 meter diameter space around you, you'll be stranded in the middle forever because you will be just floating there. So till somebody will do something to you so you can move. Uh, they did those uh, experiments on, I think on Skylab where the Skylab was very big and um, so like a small uh, crew members, it's, they couldn't really do anything if you can really hang in the middle. And uh, so uh, the answer to your question is really, it really depends what you want to do and where you go. Uh, salute stations, uh, they were small stations and they, they were launched at once, but it was very small station. Uh, and uh, same Almas, it's a military uh, version of Salut Station. Uh, so uh, again, uh, with uh, artificial gravity uh, structures, they are large. Uh, so everything will be, all these elements will be uh, brought first to low Earth orbit, or I don't know, Lagrangian point or somewhere, and then assembled together and uh, then the spacecraft would take off and start rotating. 
basically um, basically would be everything by launching it from planet earth and then the assemblant maybe would take yeah, place yeah. on on space okay yeah and you can launch at different de uh, destinations but farther you launch so less payload you can bring for obvious reason so of you course. have to have more fuel so that is mass also compact so and it it's takes, volume so that's why it's always straight off where you want but then you need you less fuel for example uh, from lagrange point to go to mars so it all depends what you want so you always do trade studies and compare what is uh, feasible what is not so and most basically locations yeah uh -huh. it's a uh, low, low earth orbit is the most uh, common place where to okay. assemble things Great. So we would basically need to everything to make like uh, in order to before we launch it to space, we need to try it on uh, the rotation, earthly rotation, I guess. Uh, like the gravity, like like the the um because you talked before about sorry I just uh, misspelled mm -hmm. it maybe uh because mm -hmm. you talked before that we we uh, have like the artificial uh, gravity which we uh toward like the rotation which is a simulation of the gravity in space, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Exactly. And this is what I meant, like everything would be before we test and send it to uh, space, you would, we would basically need to try it first with the rotation on the earthly planet. Uh, no, right? I don't see how you can do it uh, on Earth, uh, but, uh, and again, it won't be the same as it was will be no because in, maybe uh, I, I misunderstood something i just like thought that uh, a simulation of the uh, gravity is like uh, like is is toward rotation that would be a simulation of the gravity on space yeah, in like, yeah, in, yeah this is what gravity I meant. condition no, not, space, not that we yes, would yes. do it on earth no 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 yeah, no, yeah, no. Yeah, okay. I, okay 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 no i just <laughs> <laughs> wanted to make the point clear thank you so much mm -hmm. thank you <laughs> sure mm -hmm. Um, Eric, please go ahead. Eric, I cannot see you. Yeah, <clears throat> I see the in the chat, right? Ah, oh, he doesn't have a microphone, he says. Oh, okay, so I read the question. Do we need artificial gravity then before we can create orbital shipyards where we build larger ships and habitats direct in space? Yeah, well, uh, if uh, uh, artificial gravity is considered as one of the countermeasures uh, for physiological deconditioning uh, that is associated with microgravity conditions. Uh, so for long peri periods in microgravity conditions, uh, humans uh, have bone loss, muscle deterioration, uh, our hearts are uh, not you know, enlarged and uh, uh, they, uh, the fluids are shifted in the upper body and that will also create some issues with uh, vision and uh, also with sleeping. There are many, many uh, things that are associated with the microgravity conditions. So um, if uh, talking about some long presence in uh, zero G. So perhaps artificial gravity will be needed. Again, it's a big engineering challenge. There are many issues, what was happening, how you connect rotating with not rotating, how you resupply those rotating parts and all of that's maintained and stuff like that. Uh, talking about orbital shipyards. Yeah, that will be of course cool. Of course it's better from logistical point of view you don't need to launch everything uh, but you build uh, in place you build already in space so you save on launches and launches are the most expensive part of any mission uh, so that's i would say the, yes uh, if uh, we will have at some point uh, uh, shipyards in space and building directly in space, building like 3D printing again or something, uh, then uh, artificial gravity will be cool to have. Yeah. May I answer your question, Eric? I guess he will be typing. Oh. 
but mm. is it not needed then? <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is again the need uh, the need for um, building something. Maybe not exactly. If you want to uh, help uh, humans and uh, help them to maintain their physical health for long periods, of, then it will be needed. Uh, the thing is, there is no direct answer. So, for example, NASA, they did uh, quite um, a lot of studies about artificial gravity. And at some point, uh, um, small, uh, uh, the small rotating well, a module was, uh, sub, was uh, suggested, uh, centrifuge was suggested uh, to be brought and added to the International St Space Station. But then for, uh, because of um, uh, budget issues, uh, it was never uh, delivered there. Well, it was, wasn't even built uh, full and delivered to the International Space Station, but it was considered, yeah. Also, yes, that's, that's good. Yeah. yeah, so if you're interested, yeah, uh, read a lot of Ted Hall's studies. Yep. Yes, you find everything that has been mm -hmm. written or researched but, uh, on that topic on that website. Yeah, and the thing is, with uh, again, uh, Ted and Scott, and uh, you know, quite few, I would say, of us. Uh, so still pushing for artificial gravity, at least investigations. And uh, again, um, and uh, but uh, and those who folks at NASA they continue proposing their internal uh, proposals to do uh, for grants to do artificial gravity studies, but right now this official uh, NASA position is yeah it's cool to have but it's we're not funding it yet so. Maybe I can add something, Olga, because uh -huh. the problem was when we have shipyards. I see ourselves as a spacefaring nation, right? So expanding, going from A to B, and it will not be just Moon, Mars, and Earth. And the problem that we have now is that, as Olga said in her presentation, she showed it quite clearly, that uh, the law in the microgravity environment, you lose uh, calcium bone. Uh, you lose muscle strength. And it's a process that is not, you cannot stop it. You can, it can, you can make it slower, but you cannot stop it. And the longer you are, then the, the question is, can you come back to Earth, right? And when you go somewhere else and you think even of settlement, it is not known how the fertility system of the human reacts to lower gravity. So maybe it's possible, maybe it's not. And artificial gravity is one possible solution to this problem, right? Yeah, but uh, it's uh, associated with issues that we don't know. Uh, again, as I said, this uh, again, Coriolis effect is uh, important things. We don't know how it will be. Like you go one way, then you turn, and then you off again. Uh, uh, that's why it needs to be tested first in a smaller scale. So, uh, and uh, again, as I said, the systems and people. So it's not only people who don't know how they will behave, but we don't know how design uh, every single engineering systems that will work with that too. But yes, uh, absolutely, that's the same. So Mars missions, we don't know if people will adapt back to Earth easily after Mars mission. So maybe it's... Uh, it won't be that easy, that's for sure. Even though there are, of course, uh, they're supposed to exercise two hours a day uh, and in partial gravity conditions, they still will be required to exercise in at least two hours a day. Uh, also different body types, human body types uh, uh, reflect differently to microgravity conditions. So uh, I, kind of uh, thought about it, but then I also talked to doctors and they said, yes, it's true. So slender uh, and the taller people uh, actually uh, recover better than stocky. So that's um, 
also it's all a lot related to our genomics uh, and uh, so how and the same thing with plants so that thing is was quite interesting uh, that uh, plants are aging faster and uh, so humans are also aging uh, faster that's if they go to space and especially if they don't do anything to countermeasure those uh, negative effects of uh, microgravity conditions. They have other issues of uh, other means, including negative uh, pressure uh, pants, uh, like chibis and all of that stuff, but it's still uh, maybe not enough for a long period of time. Okay, more questions? Um, Anna, would you like to ask a question yourself? Um, yes, thank you. Um, you hello. hello. You, you mentioned a little bit about my question actually about the plants. So I was wondering, um, you mentioned that the plants that are grown out of space, that their nutritional value changes. And I was wondering if there have been experiments and if you have found a limit to their growth. And you just mentioned um, that uh, they age faster, like mm -hmm. the eyes. And if that's the case, if um, how this process can be optimized? So, are there? So, have you thought or are there experiments with genetically modified plants, or um, what can we do to prolong and have the same or even a better nutritional value in outer space for the same plants? Hmm. Uh, well, that's an interesting question. So if it can be modified, but I uh, didn't find uh, any um, information about that, those experiments. And doesn't mean it doesn't exist, <laughs> but uh, I, I haven't... Um, my uh, uh, favorite source of information, let's just, I'll show you. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, oh, where is it? Trying to find a good spot. <laughs> okay, hold on, I need to. Well, I'll show you, I will turn off my um, background and uh, show you. Uh, so that's uh, space biology and studies uh, uh, at uh, orbital stations. And so it's about those uh, Salute and Mars uh, uh, experiments, um, or oh, Mars, or Mir experiments, sorry. And um, uh, so also I, I did talk to all these folks uh, at MBP uh, who are dealing with it. Uh, and I didn't see any experiments of the modifying so I think it's probably still can, relatively early stage of development. So first figuring out actually what is happening before you start modifying. And maybe it's a good approach, right? Because then you can really go well. So you don't know what to compare to with what. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, perhaps that's a, a, a solution. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, another solution, as I said, in rotating uh, chambers, so even on Earth, uh, plants produce more and shorter period of time. So even though maybe they will be, their cycle will be shorter, so they will age fast, but at least production will be better. So mm -hmm. again, we're talking about uh, how much we can get, maximum what we can get uh, from this smaller <laughs> uh, uh, space, uh, like small, uh, smaller portion of uh, the uh, of the plant, right? So that will be the issue. And again, uh, the thing is, I think it's interesting how it can be combined in this uh, with other types of food. And uh, again, just making it more at least uh, nutrition. And then, yeah. So on the other hand, maybe the aging is won't be an issue if you can get this uh, closed loop Mm -hmm. faster right so that won't be an issue so okay. it just will be rotating them faster yeah mm -hmm. okay thank you
it may also be related not only with microgravity but somehow to radiation even though of course low earth orbit is protected uh, from radiation way more than it would be you know this uh, on the way to mars i'm uh, please oh, yeah i see you Hello. Well, I mean, there is a, the, the whole... Uh, I'm already answering your question, Alma. <laughs> yeah. That's what, yeah. Uh, what does it... <laughs> but you want to voice it? Sorry, what? Uh, do you want to voice your question? Uh, no, I just um, wanted to ask about the risk of contaminating. Uh, for example, uh, there are some bacteria of ours that could uh, possibly survive on Mars, for example. And um, 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 like, what what would happen? How would they um, um, grow? Or I don't know. Maybe maybe the question is to science. I don't know science fiction, or I don't know. Uh, well, uh, there is a whole um, uh, section or department at uh, NASA, and not only NASA. I believe at ESA is like all other agencies. Uh, it's about planetary protection uh, and uh, absolutely we don't want to contaminate other planets on moon or Mars uh, with our bacteria. On the other hand, I can tell you that I, I really think we already contaminated Mars because so many spacecraft was crashed there. And even though, of course, uh, there is a rule that uh, no more than 0 0.04 uh, bacteria per milliliter or something is, uh, uh, oh, I forgot what is exactly, but I mean, it's really, really like there is limitation how much bacteria can be present on the spacecraft before it's launched from uh, uh, Earth uh, is really, really strict. Uh, Anyway, so I think something is probably already there. <laughs> uh, this, um, so th there are risks, of course, and uh, when uh, humans uh, will be there with the robotic assistance, and when we start doing ISRU or something, it, there is there is a risk. Um, so that's. It's something that has to be, I guess, considered and, uh, ex well, at some point accepted. We want to minimize it anyway, mm -hmm. but... Uh, could they, and it's could a they, uh -huh. they maybe grow differently or, or have different um, specifications or, or something like, um, I don't know, not usual on Earth, and then possibly also become a threat to humans or something? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, so maybe uh, they, they may, but again, remember that uh, we are not, uh, we won't be, we as humans, we won't be walking there just like we are on Earth, right? So it's always uh, spacesuits and it's always pressurized and uh, um, uh, pressurized structures. Another thing is, of course, uh, everything leaks. It doesn't matter how well we uh, design or build uh, the structures. Everything like the atmospheric uh, pressure leakage will be happening anyway. It's just uh, mm -hmm. very, very small, so it's not a big deal. Uh, but uh, consider that contamination, maybe, maybe not. Uh, so a potential for humans to uh, bring it back to their habitats and have it contaminating inside the habitat with it. Yes, there is, of course, a risk, uh, but that means uh, that, uh, again, need to design for it. And there are, that's why we have uh, dust uh, uh, cleaning uh, devices or means uh, installed in these airlocks, or they have to be installed, or do chamber airlocks, or suit locks where you suit suits are inside in one side of the airlock and then you go so you can maintain the suit but also you don't bring anything inside the habitat. So that is the major thing that uh, may be a threat. But um, 
uh, technically, of course, it's, I think uh, uh, technically, potentially, there is a bigger threat that something will start growing inside the habitat, like mold and all of that issue, which they do have that issue on the ISS because mm -hmm. there is moisture. Where, where there are people, there is always moisture. We always we breathe with its moisture. We bring up, everybody has his or her own bacteria and all of that stuff. So that's why the air has to, in an enclosed environment, has to be constantly cleaned. That's why the air on, in aircraft is constantly cleaned. Well, in aircraft, it's a bit easier because they do get new air. They can, they have this fresh air from the atmosphere, right? Uh, and on Mars or Moon or in space, you cannot have it. So you have to constantly clean it 100%. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bill, please go forward. I think you know Olga from the final presentation. Yes, I do. Hi. Yeah, okay. Nice Hello. to meet you again. Nice. So I was wondering, after we build the ISS, uh, what do you think will be the next structure that humans are going to build in, in outer space? I've heard of things like the elevator that takes people up in space or like a spiral thing that is going to take ship, um, spaceships and give them a spin to go further into the, Ooh. <laughs> into the universe. So what do you think will be the next big step for us? Well, I mean, uh, next next step is uh, the next step, you know, lunar gateway <laughs> so far, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, that proposal that uh, was student that I showed that, uh, to test uh, rotating environment, I think that would be a logical thing to do. Uh, and uh, you probably know that there are many proposals within this axiom space uh, to uh, send a commercial station that first it will be attached to the ISS and then it will be uh, detached. Uh, Chinese space station will be there soon, yeah. And uh, so uh, Roscosmos, they also talking about an uh, uh, independent structure and uh, all other stuff, but uh, again, but uh, so, uh, so far, uh, the most uh, uh, promising or like most prominent, let's say, uh, plans are is uh, the gateway, this uh, lunar gateway, and, uh, and as an international effort. And then Artemis, uh, of course, uh, one, two, and three. Uh, Artemis one, which is a commercial payload is uh, pretty much uh, on the way, so that should be happening soon. And again, uh, yeah, Moon is now a busy, busy place. So with, uh, again, another successful uh, Chinese mission and this sample return mission. And um, so that's um, good, good. Sounds exciting, yes. Yep. But, um, mm -hmm. I also heard about um, plans to, to use the solar part of the, uh, the heat of the sun more. So mm -hmm. like circling the, the sun with mirrors or things like this. Do you think this is also a thing that we are gonna, that, that we are gonna see happening? It's what Tselkovsky was talking about. So, and so far, whatever he was saying, this everything was, is happening. <laughs> so probably that will happen too. Uh, yes, uh, definitely uh, using uh, solar solar power in more effective ways, and uh, definitely for moon operations, that is where that is good. So beaming uh, back to Earth, there are many. There were many projects beaming uh, power to Earth, but um, there are many issues uh, because of because there are too many, uh, or not too many, but many, <laughs> still many, mm, uh, not only people, but uh, also animals and, and, uh, the, and uh, birds and all of that stuff. So that's how you will be beaming stuff back to, uh, to Earth. But uh, that's uh, on the moon, the essence of the moon, yes, you can do that. All right, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Sure.
Um, maybe this is a moment to say that there are different opinions on what we shall or what we could, and what we can do. And especially when it's uh, about resources, there are people that would like to use the resources for Earth and people that are opposed to resource, uh, use resources on Earth. So it's a political discussion as well. Yeah, un yeah. Unfortunately, it is uh, very political, <laughs> and uh, well, for a reason also because most uh, missions are uh, sponsored by states, and uh, it's all uh, uh, again, uh, it's all uh, national agencies, and as national agencies are working with again states. So there is not that much of uh, commercial activities uh, or independent activities, let's say, that doesn't have to be commercial. Uh, this happening, so. Uh, using, uh, I think the, the main idea is using it smartly and if uh, not bringing whatever you bring to moon or Mars or anywhere, and then just, uh, okay, use it and leave it there and, and, and creating junkyards everywhere you will go. That I think is a bad approach. So uh, that's uh, always thinking about the exit plan. Uh, so what we will leave behind. I think that is a very important architectural task. So what we will leave behind us. Well, unless you build a pantheon or I don't know, something or a pyramid that you want to stay forever <laughs> for future generations. But otherwise think about the exit. Okay, more questions? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, you're um, at the University of Sasakawa of, uh, or in Houston. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering what's the difference um, between studying at your new university uh, compared to doing a project with Sandra or Barbara? Oh, well, maybe Sandra will better say, but uh, I mean, uh, we, uh, we have a degree and it's Master of Science in Space Architecture degree. And uh, also we have a dual degree, but that will require some engineering courses, um, prerequisites. Uh, it's a dual degree in aerospace engineering and space architecture. And uh, so the, the difference is uh, because uh, Again, it's uh, the only degree in the world, I guess. And uh, also because, uh, well, what I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. So there is a curriculum and uh, uh, also different um, uh, classes uh, related. It's not only space architecture, but it's also uh, the, some, related to engineering and related to uh, the professional in the industry. So that's, that's a difference. Okay, Sandra, what do you say? Um, well, the question, you have to, to ask the question in a better way. What's the difference between studying at the TU Munich and TU Vienna and the Angewandte? And of course there's a difference, depending what you want, right? I mean, as Olga said, at the uh, Sixth University, you can have a degree in space architecture, right? It's a three-year study program. How many years? Three years? No, well? no. It's uh, the most students is doing it at uh, two years. Mm -hmm. So, and at the TU Vienna, you can, if you like, uh, do a studio or a diploma studio, a diploma. So, a studio is uh, half a year, and. But it's architectural degree, right? Yes, it's an architectural degree. But the, yeah. the question is, what, uh, what is your question? What is the difference? Uh, <laughs> because you have, what are you looking for? Is the first uh, 
question that you have to pose to yourself. And then you find the best solution for yourself. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, since uh, the location is in Houston, if there are some, I don't know, corpor corporations between uh, the NASA and the university, and maybe... Oh, well, yeah. No. Uh, yeah, we, we do, of course, uh, have very close connections. So adjuncts, well, they're now retired from NASA, but uh, we have folks from uh, NASA and industry uh, lecturing coming all the time. We used to go to uh, Johnson Space Center every semester, uh, but uh, since that last spring, it's kind of, we don't go <laughs> for obvious reason. But, uh, <clears throat> and uh, also do have uh, projects uh, sponsored by, well, recently it's mostly Boeing and uh, so studies is mostly lunar studies. So uh, that's kind of uh, work and, um, but it's, it's not necessarily every semester <clears throat> or every year academic year. So yes, periodically we, we have that. And uh, it's very, uh, I think we're probably more uh, oriented on this uh, systems and uh, engineering part uh, of uh, design. That's, I have to say that, so. And um, that's why, he, again, those is folks who are talking about life support systems. So it's, well, I mean, Sandra has the same thing. If she's talking about life support, you have lectures from talking about life support systems, right? Who are specialists, uh, yeah. We have, uh, we have a strong focus on construction too, because the department where I am based is mm -hmm. a con construction focused department. So. That is why all the students have to um, make the project work of the civil. Mm -hmm. And I would say that uh, when you do a design studio here, and you can talk to Shil and Alma. She, they did the design studio last year. It was uh, online, but I think what you can get here in the three months is we have really the experience to get you a lot of knowledge with guest critics and guest lecturers in a very short time. And at the same time, uh, provide you the tools um, to work on a very individual project that is suits your status or your, um, your abilities as an architect. So it is a special uh, studio, but it always relates to where you are going in the future. This is what I think. So we try to uh, teach you a lot and it has to be a lot because otherwise you cannot do this design studio. But at the same time, and this is a very important goal, the goal is by doing this design studio, you start thinking on earth projects or any other projects from a, a, a more earlier starting point. You start question, questioning solutions or possible solutions earlier in, in discussing and arguing what is the real challenge. And the goal is to make you wanting to experiment and develop something innovative. At the same time, we have to, to deliver plans and sections and details and materials and life support system, yes, and greenhouse, and it all has to make sense. So it's not easy. <laughs> well, I mean, that's uh, actually, that's what, uh fascinates me with space architecture. That's why I, I like uh, doing it and teaching it, obviously. Uh, that uh, it's, um, on one hand, uh, you would think like, well, it's very specialized space. On the other hand, it's really broad. And uh, it really teaches you to look at this, all these elements and you really see it's like how how uh, uh, interconnected all our decisions are. 
uh, and it's not like uh, designing uh, a habitat or even, uh, I don't know, some part of this habitat without thinking about anything else. You really need to think through the whole mission. You really need to think uh, through activities of the crew, activities of the plants, or how or even at some point, uh, how this orbital mechanics will work, uh, how you bring things, why you bring in it. Every decision uh, affects another one and you constantly, constantly challenge yourself and challenge your decisions and uh, compare it and uh, really uh, check it against all other solutions. So it's constant interactive uh, process. Uh, well, it's the same as architects do it everywhere, but it's just in space architecture. Every decision is probably uh, becomes even more critical. And that's why it's a, a good uh, foundation to do whatever Sandra said everything else, because I think it's the right way to treat uh, any uh, problem or design problem anywhere. Uh, we don't want to create uh, uh, sculptures where people should figure out how they will live inside those sculptures, for example, or something that won't be use useful uh, or uh, in, let's say, I don't know, five years or 10 years. So it's, it has to be really uh, becomes part of uh, uh, the whole thought process and the whole philosophy, yeah. Uh, I think we have time for one or two questions, if there are some. like to ask you a more general question mm -hmm. um, not really space related but what would be your personal definition or yeah, definition of architecture be or what do you think is the, the essence of architecture or what is it for you oh that's uh, what I was just saying there here that again thinking about uh, all, how all these things connected not only with, within the building or within the structure, but how the whole process of uh, design and building that building or structure, uh, how all of that connects is connected. So what is the impact? Uh, impact of, you know, building uh, consists of elements and uh, even to produce those elements. So what is the impact of that? And what will be the impact of the final product? I like you know for example again solar panels they don't grow on trees, so if you if you incorporate that so just really thinking how feasible it will be for certain location for certain conditions, what kind of what even will require that so uh, to produce it and you know deliver like kind of looking at it the whole thing, so how those deci every decision is responsible decision. So, and I think to me that is architecture, and I think that's what is uh, uh, differences between uh, uh, architects or, like, say, engineers. It's not one is better than another, or somebody is more creative or less creative. Uh, everybody is creative in different ways, uh, but uh, this uh, with very often. Uh, is engineering perspective and approach, and again, system engineering. And with, with Sandra, we did wrote about it in our book. <laughs> uh, uh, did it. And uh, so it's okay, if it's very complex uh, problem, how we deal with it? Oh, we dissect it in, in small problems and we deal with uh, separate problems, different parts and different groups, and then we put it together, integrate it, and then we solve the big problem. But architectural approach is different from that because maybe at some point you do look at this, but you constantly look at it as a whole one problem. Uh, and uh, again, 
one is not contradicting another, it's actually the best solution is we'll be combining it all together. That's why it's good to have multidisciplinary teams. And that's why, uh, again, at NASA, or not only NASA, but in, in main, there are examples in oil and gas uh, industry too. When uh, uh, all problems happened at the integration stage of the, the project, because yes, all those perfectly uh, designed or solved issues or problems and separated problems, when they integrated together, they don't work. They're all perfect in their own ways, but they don't work perfectly together. It doesn't mean, right? So they will work perfectly together. And I think that is unique uh, uniqueness of our profession as architects that we do uh, have to look at it all together the whole thing all together and include people to that and include plans and include like all the philosophy of living and that is architecture so thank you very much mm -hmm. oh. anybody has a last question to Olga Banova Then I would like to thank you, Olga. Thank you very much for your time and for your talk and especially for the discussion at the end. Uh, it was very fruitful. To thank you. And all of you, I wish you a happy holiday. And I see you in January. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, happy. yeah. Uh, Merry Christmas, happy holidays and uh, thanks. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Thank Thank you, you. so much. Bye.